good to be together again tonight. I want to thank each of you for making the effort to be here, and hopefully God will reward and bless that decision. I want to thank Timothy for the song selection. I think you'll find the songs match the sentiment of our study very well tonight as we continue our loose theme related to biblical events and characters. We want to study the book and character of Jonah. That's a very popular, well-known biblical event, biblical account. In fact, my oldest son, Kyson, that was his favorite story for us to read and talk about. Uh, Very early on, he would always say, let's talk about Jonas. I want to read the story of Jonas. And it's a very, very popular story, and yet it's probably one of the most criticized stories in the entire Bible. Many unbelievers and skeptics obviously are very skeptical and say that is impossible. That couldn't have happened. And sadly, many Christians have adopted a similar view of this account by saying it's figurative to illustrate truths. It's not, it didn't literally happen. Some critics will say that there is a discrepancy when some places talk about a great fish swallowing Jonah. In other places, the translation says a whale swallowed Jonah, and they'll say a whale is a mammal, not a fish. But it's likely at that time those classification distinctions did not exist. And when you look at the Hebrew word dag, sometimes translated fish, and the new, uh, Greek word ketos, sometimes translated fish or whale, they're actually generic terms for aquatic creatures. So really a better translation would be a sea creature or a sea monster. And yet, again, unbelievers will say it's impossible for a human to exist and survive inside of a sea creature for 72 hours. Yet we have accounts of people who have done just that. And even scientists admit and recognize there are in fact sea creatures that still exist that are capable of swallowing objects much larger than humans found it interesting, they made a discovery, read an article about this a year or two ago, this fish factory, this ancient Roman fish factory on the Mediterranean coast, and they did testing of this fish factory, and DNA testing revealed they also were processing whales, many of which they were very surprised to learn existed in the Mediterranean Sea at that time. But you know, this debate about what swallowed Jonah and how did he do it, and really is irrelevant for us as Christians if we believe in the supernatural. The real question is, is supernaturalism credible? If God exists, if Jesus rose from the dead, then supernatural events are possible. Miracles are possible. And the Bible makes it clear we're talking about a miraculous event here. And so as we study the story of Jonah... Jonah, this book is as much about the messenger as it is about the actual message. Very interesting, very unique book. Jonah prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II, king of Israel, around the same time as the prophets Hosea and Amos, who predicted that God would use the Assyrian Empire as an instrument to punish his people. And so you can see why any good patriotic Israelite like Jonah... (laughs) would like to see the Assyrians destroyed. Any, in his mind, any good Assyrian was a dead Assyrian. What's also interesting is the prophet Nahum later would prophesy against the Assyrian Empire and how God would punish the Assyrian Empire. And he gave very specific details about how that would happen. The walls were going to be broken down. And history confirms that a flood occurred that broke down part of their walls, allowing the Medes to enter in. It was going to occur during a state of drunkenness. History confirms that the king of Nineveh himself was drunk with the soldiers when this happened and that it would never be rebuilt. And the ancient ruins lie just across the river from the city of Mosul that you've likely heard on the news in the last couple of years. It's also interesting they have made some archaeological discoveries of tablets that have confirmed the details of the Bible concerning this empire. One particular detail that's very interesting, for a long time, critics of the Bible said that the Bible made a mistake when it talked about Sargon, king of Assyria. And yet they found evidence that this king actually existed and even found and uncovered his palace. And his palace mentions the Bible, or the battle recorded in Isaiah 20, 
on a wall painting in that particular passage. Amazing discoveries that confirm time and time again the accuracy and reliability of the Bible. They've also made additional archaeological discoveries showing what the Assyrians did in Israel, how they impaled captives, how they skinned captives alive. They were a very brutal and wicked people. They also made another really interesting discovery. The king of Assyria in his annals and his records brags about shutting King Hezekiah up behind his walls like a bird in a cage. As he came upon, they uh, took the Israelite kingdom, the northern kingdom captive. Eventually they come into Judah, take some cities in Judah, and eventually they get to Jerusalem, the capital city. And he brags about shutting up Hezekiah behind these walls, yet he never brags about taking the city. Why? Because he didn't take the city. The Bible tells us why. In the middle of the night, God had 185,000 of those soldiers killed, and he went back home. And they have found this tunnel known as Hezekiah's Tunnel in preparation for this siege. He stopped up water, had it redirected through this tunnel into the city. Amazing discoveries that again confirm time and time again the accuracy and reliability of the Bible. And so much to his dismay, Jonah is called by his God to go preach to these people. Now, he was given a message he would have liked, (laughs) very severe and very harsh, but he knew that he served a God who was gracious and merciful and loving, and that if these people repented, God would forgive them, and he could not bear the thought of that. And so he runs in the opposite direction as far as he possibly could. At the end of the known world at that time, on the coast of Spain, But God had other plans for Jonah, and he sends a storm. And the sailors on that ship try to determine, how did this calamity come upon us? Pray to your gods. And eventually Jonah says, it's me, and suggests they throw him overboard, which they eventually do. And God sends a great sea creature or sea monster to swallow Jonah, and the belly of that sea monster serves as a classroom for three days. Eventually, Jonah sped up upon dry ground to go to Nineveh like God called him to do to preach a very harsh and clear message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Jonah preaches his message. The people repent in sackcloth from the king to the common under 185,000 people, 120,000 people. And Jonah goes and finds a spot overlooking the city. God prepares a plant. Jonah finds relief from the heat. And he's, for the first time in the entire book, we read Jonah's happy. But then God kills the plant with the worm and Jonah's unhappy to the point of death and he is distraught that instead of destroying these people, God saved them. And I think the ultimate lessons we learn in this book are contained in Jonah chapter 4, the last chapter of this book we want to talk about for a little while tonight. And thankfully we get to learn these lessons in the comforts of this beautiful building instead of the belly of a sea monster. And we want to learn these lessons for a little while tonight. The first lesson that leaps off the page is the book of Jonah, and essentially every page in the Bible, is the fact that God is sovereign. God is in control. And again, we ought to be reminded of that now more than ever. Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord prepared a great fish. Jonah chapter 4, the Lord God prepared a gourd, prepared a plant. God prepared a worm. God's in control. And we are sorely mistaken if we think that destinies of mankind are dependent upon National economics, national defense, nuclear weapons. God is in control. God was in control of the weather. God was in control of the sea monster. God was in control of the plant. God was bigger than the sea monster. God was bigger than the plant, bigger than our creature comforts. God is in control. And we see that in the story of Jonah. We see as we talk about the omnis, God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, all-knowing. We see that in the story of Jonah. We see that God is omnipresent. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Psalm 139, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. You can't run far and fast enough. And Jonah learned that lesson the hard way. As Paul told the Athenians, he's not far 
from every one of us. And that's a comforting thought for the righteous and the obedient, that God is near, that God is accessible. We talked about in all His might and His size and the universe is what He's created. He still chooses to dwell in the smallest of places with you and me, but it's the most terrifying thought in truth for the wicked and the disobedient. You can't run far and fast enough. And I'm not sure if Jonah actually thought that was possible. Surely a prophet of God knew God was omnipresent. So I don't know if he was trying to run from God, but if he did, he sure ran, he, he sure went big. It's like God telling you to go to New York and you go into Hawaii instead. When he ran, he really ran. But maybe what Jonah was really doing was not trying to run from the presence of God, but to make it clear, he was quitting his prophetic work. He was not interested in doing the mission God gave him. And maybe we don't get on a boat, but we do the exact same thing concerning the work God has given to us. God is omnipresent. I think about our children sometimes seem omnipresent. <laughs> you can't get away. They hear everything. They see everything. That's why we have to resort to eating ice cream in the pantry and in the laundry room. <laughs> you know, my case, he managed a... Walmart and Amarillo, they've since moved, but during the Bluebell crisis, when people were opening Bluebell lids and ruining Bluebell ice cream and licking the Bluebell ice cream, I told them, if you want to put an end to that in your Walmart, hire my boys, because as soon as a Bluebell lid is cracked, they are right there. We were driving here Saturday. We had a bag of goodies for the long trip, and Lincoln was asleep in the back. Kyson's watching a movie the whole way here, nine hours. <laughs> and so I discreetly got into the fruit snacks, Opened them quietly. I don't think they heard it. don't think they could see me do it, but Kyson, with his headphones on, screams from the back of the pickup, I smell fruit snacks. <laughs> it's like, you got to be kidding me. And that awareness of what they see and what they hear is very motivating. I want to tell you, you don't see anything, you don't say anything, you don't think anything, you don't get into anything that God doesn't know about. And a continual awareness about the continual presence of God should motivate righteousness in our lives. So this leads to our next point. Running from God is more dangerous than walking with God. You see this powerful, poetic language in Jonah chapter 2. I cried by reason of my affliction out of the belly of hell. Cried I into the deep and in the midst of the seas. The floods compassed about me. The waves crashed over me. I am cast out of your sight. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. And that's what happens when we make this self-destructive decisions through our disobedience to God and our refusal to submit to God's will for us. We get claustrophobic. And the walls begin to close in all around us. You know, leading up to this story, to this event, we see Jonah was asleep while in grave danger. And how often does that describe us spiritually? And the irony was a pagan sailor had to tell a prophet of God to pray. That's where he was at. Had to tell him to pray. And yet we see God's gracious and corrective hand trying to bring us back before we get there, before it's too late. Out of the scary place. A while back, a couple years ago, Kelsey and I were in Cape Cod. And we went well watching. First thing in the morning, because we're always on a schedule, we were the first ship out. Now, FYI, the first ship goes and finds where all the wells are so that the other ships can get there quicker. But we still were able to see a lot of sea creatures. Amazing creatures. Huge humpback whales as they surfaced to get air and then they would flip their tail and dive. It was amazing. But I sat there thinking when, we got, when they were really close to the boat, I wanted no part of getting in the water with those whales. I know they were pretty harmless, much less great white sharks that were in the area. I'm not going to swim with Shamu at SeaWorld or Free Willy. Not interested in that. And imagine being out at sea in the water, in the darkness at night, Think about people during World War II as their ships were sunk. And being out in shark-infested waters, how scary that must have been. Think about the fear Jonah must have been experiencing that he describes here. And yet we see God's corrective hand trying to bring us back before it's too late. Out of the scary place. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, and my soul fainted with me. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. 
We see God using events in our lives, maybe even near-death experiences, that we don't even realize how close we were to death at times, using the providence of God, using experiences to wake us up to our blindness, <laughs> that we can't see that we're hurting ourselves and hurting those around us. And there are times in our lives where our choices seem as irrational as Jonah's choice to run from a God he described as the God of land and sea, yet he got on a boat. How often do we do things that completely contradict what we know and what we claim to believe? And I want to ask you to consider tonight, what are the things that God has called you to do that you're running from and that you are avoiding? You can't run far and fast enough. Running from God is always more dangerous than walking with God. One of my favorite concepts in this book is Jonah chapter 1, verses 3 and verse 4. Notice verse 3 says, but Jonah, verse 4 says, but the Lord. We see the providence of God. We see God can use events in our lives to wake us up to the destruction that we're creating in our life. Hebrews chapter 4, the word of God is quick and powerful, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It reminds me of a Johnny Cash song. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later God will cut you down. We also learn from this story, serving isn't always convenient. Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord came into Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. This would have been over a month's journey, and we won't get in our air-conditioned cars and drive 10 minutes to church or 10 minutes to the lost. Serving isn't always convenient, and we won't get outside of our comfort zone. We won't step outside of our box to save this city because we're consumed with our comforts. Jonah cared more about his comfort and this plant than he cared about people. And we find that appalling, but is that not the truth for us? God blesses us more than we need and we have all these excesses and privileges and freedoms and rights and we allow those blessings to become curses in our life that distract us and hinder us from our primary purpose and they become idols. Philippians chapter 2, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Put on the mind of Christ, who made himself a servant, emptied himself, humbled himself, became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. Serving isn't always convenient. We see pride and self-centeredness throughout the book of Jonah. We see arrogance maybe. I'm God's people. He despised the Assyrians. I'm God's people. Well, congratulations. How'd you become God? I was born into God's people. Okay. Very good, Jonah. I'm God's people. I'm better than these people. But if you'll start running with God, we'll eventually find ourselves running to those things that before we were running away from. Start valuing and caring and seeing people the way God does and you'll be willing to travel great distances at great expenses, at great inconveniences because you're focused on God and others and not yourself. The next lesson we learn in this story is that God cares about everyone and we should too. And I think maybe this is the ultimate lesson or takeaway from this story. I think a lot of times we stop after chapter 3 when we read in these children's Bible stories, Jonah disobeyed God, God had the fish swallow Jonah, sped him back on land, Jonah went and obeyed God, and we stop at chapter 3. There's a fourth chapter. And I think there are a lot of lessons and concepts we need to grasp in chapter 4, and we need to teach our children about nationalism and about racism that we see in Jonah chapter 4. How God views people and how we should view people. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Yet Jonah did not want to do that. We see in the Great Commission, we're told to go to all the world, to go to every creature. Jonah at least probably liked the message, but he was not interested in their salvation. You know what Jonah wanted to see? The fireworks. It's easy to think that Jonah's afraid of the Assyrians, and he would have had good reason to be. We talked about their brutality, but you know what he really was afraid of? Jonah chapter 4 reveals his greatest fear. Verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? 
Therefore I fled before into Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. If you're going to save these people, I'd rather die. What a beautiful prayer, Jonah. And again, the irony was Jonah didn't realize that God was treating them like he had treated him and giving them a second chance because God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and tenth chances. But Jonah hated their guts and wanted to see them burn. Do we ever feel that way about people? People in here? People out there? People that look like us, people who don't look like us, people we know, people we know of, people we don't know, people in the Middle East, <laughs> people with different religions. I was preaching a meeting one time in a place, and that particular Sunday morning I was talking about love, and you're going to see why here in a moment. And in the course of that sermon, I talked about how one of the greatest challenges of love and test of love is being able to love your enemy. When someone's treating you like whoever that is, enemies of God maybe, non-Christians, other religions who hate and persecute you. Can we love Muslims? Can we love members of ISIS? That was a big deal at that time. And the man that got up to preside at the Lord's Supper, the irony in this, the ultimate act and gift of love, you know what his speech to prepare our hearts and minds? I just don't know about that. I just don't know about that. Well, Jesus was pretty clear about that. <laughs> And I think sometimes like that man and like Jonah, we are completely out of touch with the heart and mind and feeling of God. When God's happy, we're unhappy. When God's unhappy, we're happy. I think the ultimate lesson in this story is, again in Jonah chapter 4, as we continue to read in verse 4, then said the Lord, do you do well to be angry? Are you right to be angry? And Jonah goes to watch the fireworks and he's sitting under this plant and he's finally happy for the first time and God prepares a worm to destroy the plant. And Jonah's angry again and God asks him again, do you do well to do angry? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein more, are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? He says, am I not right to love people? To love everybody? We know a lot of people that don't know their right hand from their left hand. There's a lot of that going around today. Spiritually, doctrinally, morally, the plan of salvation, New Testament Christianity, worship, etc. What are we doing about that? He said, should I not care about these people too? Should I not love these people too? And it's kind of a brilliant but frustrating ending. Just abruptly ends like this. Don't ever hear what happens next. If you want Jonah to have a better ending, write it. Write it. Let's have a love that takes initiative and gets involved in the lives of other people. The love that, that, that loves everybody. There's a lot of talk about racism right now. And kind of my thoughts on that is, are we still, we still haven't figured this out? As Christians especially, we still haven't figured this out. Adam and Eve, Noah and his family, common ancestry, all created by God. I don't know, I blame the theory of evolution for a lot of that. Survival of the fittest and the racism we see in that theory of the su superior races or species. But you know what we've discovered genetically? Genetic variation between us and a complete stranger, even different races. You know what the difference, they say, is 0.01%. There's not many races. There's one race, the human race. The Bible's clear about that. There's not many skin colors. There's one skin color. There's just different shades of it. The only difference is the amount of chemical, melanin. Some people have more melanin than I do, and usually we say they're superior for having more of something. Why am I more superior for having less melanin? Complete and utter foolishness, especially from a Christian biblical perspective and worldview, and we're still, we still haven't figured it out. Should I not love these people too? You think about how Jonah loved his comfort, he loved his plants more than he loved other people. And that's very convicting for me and Kelsey because we love our plants. <laughs> 
We love our flower bed and we love our grass. When we're outside, I can't help to go by them like a drill sergeant to inspect if there's weeds in the flower bed or how the grass is looking. And I invest a lot of time and money and anxiety worrying about my flower bed and my grass. And I want to tell you, if I don't invest more time and money and anxiety in people, there's a serious problem. And I don't know. Maybe we don't do a complete 180 from the mission God's given us from people. Maybe it's just that we're drifting like we talked about Monday night. We're distracted. We're so caught up in business pursuits that we forget to pursue souls. Satan distracts us with all these things and we're so concerned about warning people about the perils of sugar and certain brands of toilet paper and we're selling them things to help them physically and that's great. God bless you. That's not wrong. But if we cared as much about spirit, people's spiritual health as we did their physical health, we'd turn the world upside down. But we read an, in, an article on the internet and suddenly we're an internet guru lining everybody out on Facebook about all these things. And in our effort to educate and bless people, we come across as ignorant and er, or arrogant or both. And we damage and we lo- lose our credibility and our influence. For what cause? Vanity of vanities that won't matter when we're dead or our audience is dead. And Satan has us so busy chasing squirrels that we have forgotten how to fish. People can change. Another ultimate message in this book. The people of Nineveh believed. They proclaimed a fast. They put on from the greatest to the least. Even the beast (laughs) were wearing sackcloth. People can change. Contrary to Calvinism and all these theories, people can change. You ought to see that truth when you look in the mirror because hopefully you're still changing for the better. Now, I'm not going to be naive. We can change for the worst. Sometimes you get to a point with maybe somebody where you're casting your pearls before a swine, but people can change. We see that in Nineveh. We see that here. Jimmy Hayes has been here from prison to preacher. Some of you are familiar with the story of my Uncle Mark. It's amazing. They could do a Hallmark movie about that. And I remember when all that went down and happened and over the years as things got worse and worse and he was miserable to be around and he slept the whole time when we were together at family functions and he wasn't very pleasant. And, we, and I remember thinking at one point, he'll never change. And then to the glory of God, he does. People can change. We see a marriage reconciled. We see a whole family put back together making up for lost time. People can change. Luke 11 verse 30 says, Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh. Historians say that there were plagues that occurred right before Jonah went to Nineveh, maybe preparing them for this message. Sometimes people have to be flat on their back to look up and be ready to look up at God. The sign of Jonah, maybe they are familiar with what happened to Jonah, which would have got their attention. Titus chapter 2, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace is offered for everybody, but notice what it comes doing, teaching us. Notice that when God gave Jonah a second chance, he didn't say, well, if you don't feel like it, if it's still too hard, you can do something else like we do today. (laughs) He gave him the exact same command he gave him originally. He said, go do it. Many cry legalism. What if the people of Nineveh had responded to that message to repent? Legalism, you're trying to earn, you're being intolerant and judgmental, Jonah. I want to tell you, it's not loving to watch people driving off the proverbial cliff while you smile and wave because you don't want to insult their navigation. The grace of God comes teaching us. We have to teach the message God has given to us. But as we teach it, we have to always remember that we have experienced the grace, kindness, and love and patience of God ourselves. It's easy to condemn, but it's more needful to rescue. People can choose. That's again, contrary to Calvinism. We see that in the story of Jonah. God saw their works. Notice the role of works and salvation. You've got to respond to the grace that comes teaching. There's a response that we have to do not to merit salvation, but to submit to God. God saw their works. God repented of the evil that He said that He would do unto them, and He did not. Prophecy itself is conditional, along with our salvation. God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, yet that didn't happen. Why? Because it's conditional. Premillennialists would do well to, to... Learn that truth as they wait for God to restore land to Israel. Not going to happen. It's conditional. 
Calvinists would do well. Conditional. Matthew 12, verse 41, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Notice the means by which God effected this change. Not by direct operation of the Spirit, not through some miracle, not through some direct communication, but it pleases God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The change is affected through the Word, and that's why this is so important. Humans teaching humans, we see that throughout the book of Acts. People today clamor for these additional signs like they did then that with Jesus. We talked about the Pharisees. Give us a sign. I want to be special. I want a direct message from God. I want a miracle from God. We wait for these modern day miracles, but notice that it, Jesus says it's through the preaching that the people repented. And that's why, again, this is so important because if you think about your family, your friends, your neighbors and coworkers, people you know that nobody else here knows, if you don't tell them, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? And finally, we see Jonah, a type of Jesus. You know, the credibility of Jesus in part depends upon the authenticity of this story. Jesus said this really happened. He talked about Jonah and said this was the sign of Jonah and compared it to his resurrection from the dead. He answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at this judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. As we offer an invitation, I want to tell you there is something greater than Jonah. It's Jesus. The ultimate proof, he said, I'm not going to, I've already given you proofs. Believe because of the works that I've done, the miracles that I performed, but there's only one remaining, the resurrection, the ultimate proof. And if you won't believe that, nothing else is going to convince you. The ultimate proof. As Peter preached the gospel sermon and preached about the resurrection of Jesus, they were maybe within walking distance of the tomb of Jesus. All they had to do to destroy Christianity was produce a dead body, and they couldn't do it. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, If Christ be not risen, our faith is vain, our preaching is vain, we're liars, we're of all men most miserable, of this life we have hope, but Christ has risen from the dead. And he goes on to talk about all the eyewitnesses to that fact, including Paul himself. And how do you explain none of the eyewitnesses recanted? All the apostles died preaching what? I saw Jesus after his death and it changed everything. I was that, now I'm this, in between Jesus. What did they have to gain? What advantage did they get from a worldly standpoint? They lost their money, their status. They gave up things they had held dear their entire life, keeping the Sabbath. And they gave all that up for something they knew didn't happen? When you say, I saw Jesus after his death, that's either true or not true. And you know, and why would you die and put your family at risk for something that you know is not true? I want to tell you, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. And if you won't believe that, nothing else will convince you. And as we offer an invitation, a greater than Jonah is here. Respond to the sign of Jonah tonight. Be buried with Him. Be buried like Jonah into the abyss, resurrected out of the abyss of your sins to walk with Him in newness of life, to do what God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. You have that decision before you now. Maybe you've done that previously, and as a Christian, maybe you need an attitude adjustment like Jonah. Maybe you need to be more caring and loving towards other people and towards the mission God has given to you. Be careful what you ask for. God will give you the opportunities. And if you need to respond to the sign of Jonah tonight, a greater than Jonah is here, and he invites you to come, please have a seat on the front as we stand and sing together.